So what could be more important to you, more intimately familiar to you, more central to your sense of who and what you are than your mind? You know, and the word mind, it used to refer to something singular, substantial, almost soul-like. But modern science is deconstructing the mind. Multiple disciplines are studying it at multiple levels of reality. And each discipline is using different methods, gathering different data, using different terms to talk about this level. Now, if you'll allow me an analogy, it's like this. It's like each discipline is its own unique language. Each one has a conceptual vocabulary, its own special theoretical grammar. So for example, neuroscience studies the mind as the brain. And you, neuroscientists gather fMRI data, EEG data, and they talk about it in terms of neuronal firing and neuronal wiring. But notice how different that is from another discipline that studies the mind in a different way. Computer science, artificial intelligence. They study the mind as information processing. And there, what they do is they make machines. They gather their data by making machines that are supposed to be instances of cognition. And they talk about that data in terms of programs and learning algorithms, neural networks. Now notice how those two languages are different from the language used by the discipline that has been traditionally tasked with talking about and explaining the mind, psychology. See, psychology studies mind as behavior. It uses the method of experimentation, gathers statistical data, and then analyzes it and talks about it using terms like working memory, problem formulation. But notice how it's leaving, leaving something out. It's leaving out what's happening right now. Think about what's happening right now. I'm making noises come out of my face hole, and you're getting ideas in your head. There's language, right? And what's more representative of cognition than language? Language communicates the mind. It facilitates the mind. It conveys the mind. So, of course, there's a discipline that studies the mind as language, and that's linguistics. And what do linguists do? Well, they, they gather their participants, they ask them to make judgments about, is this utterance grammatical? Can you put these word sounds together? And then they talk about that data using notions like transformational grammar, deep structure. But something is still being left out. Something's still being left out. You see, long before the internet networked computers together, culture networked people together into distributed cognition. Groups of people working in concert together. Most of our problem solving is done collectively with distributed cognition. It takes distributed cognition to put on a conference. It takes distributed cognition to do science. Distributed cognition to run a university. Distributed cognition to run an airline. Culture is central to cognition because most of our most important problem solving, most important thought is done culturally. Look around you. This is all the result of distributed cognition. So, of course, there's a discipline that studies the mind as cultural. Cognition is culture. And that's anthropology. And it uses a, a, a totally unique method, participant observation. I mean, anthropologists do this amazing thing, right? They go to another culture. They experience culture shock. They go through the process of being enculturated, that powerful transformational process. And they write about that transformation. They produce ethnography. 
Do you see what I'm saying? Each one of these is legitimate. Each one of these is picking up on a level of reality. Each one is talking about the mind, but they're talking about it in very different languages. And that's problematic. See, it's problematic because there's the danger that when we talk about mind, or when we think about mind, that we're going to fall into confusion. The confusion that is born out of equivocation. Equivocation is when your thinking and reasoning falls into absurdity and confusion because you're using the same term without realizing that it has different meanings. Let me give you an example where I think you will catch the equivocation so it'll be obvious what I'm talking about. Here's an example of an equivocation. Nothing is better than long life and happiness. A peanut butter and jelly sandwich is better than nothing. Put them together. A peanut butter and jelly sandwich is better than nothing, and nothing is better than long life and happiness. So ergo, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich is better than long life and happiness, so you should eat one and then kill yourself. <laughs> So that's obviously ridiculous, right? That's what equivocation does. That's the kind of absurdity and confusion. But here's the point I'm making. Most of the time when we're talking about mind, we're equivocating without realizing it. We're falling into a fundamental confusion. But there's an additional difficulty with the way that modern mind has been deconstructed by science. Look, think about those levels I told you about. The brain level the information processing level, the behavioral level, the language level, the cultural level. It's highly unlikely that those levels are working in isolation from each other. It's much more plausible that they're causally interacting, interpenetrating, and affecting each other, constraining and informing each other. But you see, if the disciplines are speaking different languages and they're isolated from each other, we have no way of capturing that causal interaction between the levels. And that causal interaction is gonna be central to what it is to have a mind. So in addition to a deep confusion, we face deep ignorance. We have these gaps between the levels because the disciplines can't really talk to each other very well. So the modern mind in the hands of modern science is like Humpty Dumpty after the Great Fall. Shattered, broken pieces on the ground. We need all the king's horsemen to put it back together again. Where are we going to find these horsemen and these horsewomen? There's a discipline that takes on the daunting but doable task of trying to put the mind back together. The discipline's called cognitive science. It's what I teach at the University of Toronto. You see, cognitive science is taking all of that empirical evidence, all that amazing theory from all these disciplines, and then it's tackling the philosophically daunting task of trying to come up with an integrating, bridging conceptual vocabulary. A bridging and integrating theoretical grammar so that these various disciplines can talk to each other in a mutually informative and transformative way because if they can integrate, then we can capture the way the levels of the mind are integrated. We can avoid the equivocation we can avoid its confusion. We can avoid, we can stitch over those gaps and avoid the ignorance. But there's a further reason why cognitive science is trying to reintegrate the mind. A reason that I think is more existentially pressing. You see, as the mind has been fragmented, so have we. 
and our self-understanding has been fragmented. Modern science has created this amazing worldview, but we don't fit in it. We're homeless. Do you understand why? Look, you know the one thing that we don't have a scientific explanation of? is how we produce scientific explanations. <laughs> you know why? Because that requires an integrated account of the mind. We don't fit into the scientific worldview. That's led to a crisis. We're fragmented and we're disconnected from, from the worldview that we've generated. I call this with the work I've done with some of my fellow co-authors, the meaning crisis. Look, we're vacillating. We vacillate between thinking we might just be mere meat machines and romantically thinking, oh, no, surely, surely there is something mysterious and magical about me. <laughs> right? We wonder if we have a soul, but we fear with gnawing anxiety that death is absolutely final. We crave to be integrated and made whole. We crave to be connected back to the world. We crave that meaning. But we don't understand how our fragmented disconnected mind could possibly generate such meaning and connection. So the confusion and the ignorance are exacerbated by a gnawing alienation and despair. But you see, as cognitive science tries to put all those things back together again, as it's reintegrating the mind to overcome the equivocation and the ignorance, it's putting into our hands the potential to put the mind back together again and put it back together again with the world. Thank you very much. <laughs>